Hello everyone, thank you Sophie, it's really nice to be back. Uh, I hope you can all hear me okay. I, shall we just do a little sound check, Sophie, and check everyone's hearing okay? Yeah. If there's any problems, just let um, Sophie know. Um, I'm working on two computers today, um, video through my iPad and sound through my PC. So if you see me turn my head a little bit, is I'm checking time on my PC, but I want you to be able to um, see me and hear me. Um, but obviously if there's any issues as, along as we go, do let me know. So it's a real pleasure to be back um, and I'm really passionate passionate about children's health and I want to give you some of my clinical pearls of working with children. So this isn't an A to Z of children's nutrition. I'm not going to be going through each age group and talking about the specific nutrients, although I will talk about um, case studies as we go. This is about the practicalities of working with children um, and, and the motivators uh, and how to really support children and their families in the best possible way. So just to remind you a little bit about me. So I'm a nutritional therapist um, and I've been in practice over six years now. I've seen over over a thousand clients in that time and have a really busy uh, practice where I see people of all ages including children um, I also uh, love getting uh, people to get their hands on food, so I do quite a lot of practical workshops as well. Um, this is me and my own family, so I do a lot of recording in my kitchen with my two children as well. Um, and I'm trying to um, break down the myth that it's difficult to get kids in the kitchen. Um, and I'm really excited that I have an a online program which is being launched in just two weeks, which is my 30-day sugar detox for families. So really excited about that. Um, and and I've also um, been working alongside um, the Telegraph and um, Aldi as their nutritional therapist and they went up to the Olympics. So um, let's look through what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and obviously, so if you'll collate any questions that you might have along the way. Um, this is a really vast topic to cover in an hour. Um, but what I want to focus on, I thought, what will be most useful for you? So uh, I think, uh, you know, logistical challenges. Why is it different working in clinic with children what changes compared to when you're working with adults uh, the other thing to be looking at is you know how we're going to be overcoming those challenges and managing expectation um, you know you're not just dealing with one person you're dealing with lots of different people um, involved in the care of this child um, at, at all ages so you know you need to be able to manage their expectation um, you know, it's the elephant in the room is one thing I um, talk about quite a lot. Um, and um, what that is, is about how to communicate with children about very sensitive issues. Um, things like their weight, their, uh, you know, bowel movements. Uh, are they eating sugar? Are they not, not eating enough vegetables? Sometimes, you know, it's, it's important to gauge how you're going to broach these subjects with children. And that also depends on the parents and who's with them and how they talk about things with them at home. So uh, we're also going to be talking about how to motivate children and their parents to make those changes, because it's not just about getting the child on board, particularly when they're over um, five or six years old, but also about getting, um, you know, compliance from the parents and all the people that are surrounding them. I'm sorry, I can see that some of you are saying you can't see me and maybe uh, it's not working with me using two uh, computers. And I'm sorry, so I'll just focus on sound at the moment, if that's okay, Sophie. So, um, right, let's look through. We'll also be looking at some case studies today as well. Um, so from babies to teenagers and young adults. Um, so there's a number of cases I'm going to look at and we'll see what time we have uh, today. But uh, one of the first case studies is about a 10 year old um, who was brought to me by her mum who was uh, putting on a lot of weight. Um, baby with food intolerances and eczema, young child with chronic constipation, 10 year old with suspected ADHD, teenager continually fainting with the headaches, a preteen boy with gut disturbances, behavioral difficulties, weight gain, and a severely autistic child with very limited food intake. So a real um, broad range um, of of, uh, cases that I hope we can you know will give you uh, uh, lots of really useful information that you can put into practice um, so you know I just think it's fun working with children and but it's not for everyone I think you need to be really clear as to whether it's right for you you know you can make a profound difference to a child's life and to their family's life and obviously you know naturally parents worry about their children um, but it can be tough you know I, I recognize that 
whiteboarding picture a lot with my own children. It's very hard when you cook uh, a beautiful meal um, and you have a child at that age that you can't reason with as to why she needs to eat her broccoli and her greens or whatever it is you're trying to get her to eat. Um, and then you imagine then you've gone and got to work with a parent who just says, well, I'm not going to do it anymore because I, she won't eat it. You know, it's, it's a, an interesting uh, mix of emotions that you have to work with. Um, but you know the impact you can have is profound. You know I'm a big believer that uh, um, in working for, with children as young as possible. I, I work a lot with schools because you know you can have an impact not only on a, a child as an adult, but that will then pass through the generations. You know if we get more children cooking and eating better, then you know generationally they will pass that knowledge down. And um, so you can have such a profound impact. So key challenges. So first of all, some of these I've kind of hinted at. So who has booked the appointment? Um, usually it's not the child, um, although you can get some motivated teenagers who want to call, um, but usually it's a parent. Usually in, in most cases, in my experience, it's the mother. Um, and you're often working there with a network of people and how can you get the message to all of them is really key to bear in mind. So you've got health visitors, GPs, pediatricians. Grandparents is an interesting one. You because uh, I always talk to the mums and parents that I work with about getting the message through to the whole family you know it's about consistency and I'm, I'm not saying that children should never have treats and I know that grandparents very often like to give love with treats but if you can actually sit you know talk to them about sitting down uh, with grandparents and actually explaining why are we on this specific diet why are we working with our, our child in this way hopefully that might help and tell them rather than you must not bring this you know what can they bring instead tell them like this is an acceptable amount of say chocolate this is the kind of chocolate you can bring or can you bring them these little toys instead of bringing them sweets and chocolate all this all, all the time obviously father you know the amount of families um uh, that uh, that, that I talk to where you know the mom says you know well I can't get my husband to eat greens either so you know it's 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 about getting on board uh, and, and actually the whole family um, working together school really interesting you know my children are now uh, five and eight and I'm shocked still at the state of school meals um, and the amount of sweets that are given out as treats and prizes at schools um, so it's, it's a it's a difficult one uh, and of course the local authority because you may be working with children as I have in quite a lot of situations um, that are under the care of uh, foster carers uh, in residential care I spent a couple of years working with severely autistic children in a, a full-time residential care unit and one of the case studies I've brought is from there um, I like to look at what my work as family food education, you know, it, this resonates out to the whole family. Quite often when you work with kids, the real delight is that mum says, oh, I've tried that and I'm feeling really good as well. Or, you know, it helps with their siblings. Um, you know, it actually starts penetrating out to the whole family. It's so important that they're all on board, of course, but you can have a really positive impact in so many different areas, which is just wonderful. So here's a really key question. Um, does a child need to be present? Of course, you know, if you were working with an adult, you would always be communicating directly with them about their case, whether that's in person or you might be working remotely with them. Um, and it's a really difficult question and it depends uh, uh, on the situation. You know, think about the age of the child. So um, I have a client I'm working with at the moment who has a five-year-old um, who has suspected uh, suspected to be on the autism spectrum and her test results came back three weeks earlier than I had expected she's done a one test and uh, I wanted to get the mum in as soon as possible daughter was at school she didn't want to take her daughter out of school so I said look just come in bring me some pictures this time and then you can bring your daughter with you next time um, you know I felt it was more important to work directly with the mum so it really depends on the case you know you for those of you who have children know that you have to have eyes in the back of your head particularly when they're little you know and you want that parent to be able to concentrate so what I do uh, it depends again on the age of the child but generally if they're under eight I might say look can you bring them along for the first uh, five to ten minutes so that I can you know meet them and see them I think it's important particularly when they get to six and seven and eight that they're engaged in the process and you can have a little chat with them um, but also visually you want to be looking 
looking at things like, you know, do they have allergy shyness? How pale is their skin? What kind of weight are they? Because you can ask a parent, are they a healthy weight? But they might not actually know, you know, and shapes are changing um, what their behavior is like. Do they seem a little bit wired? Are they quite sleepy? And all these things can be really good clues. Um, so I do like to meet the child. If I can't meet them straight away, I always get them to bring some pictures. And most parents have some pictures on their phone phone um, as well and if it's a, a six or seven year old I might say you know get someone to bring them back the last five or ten minutes this is what I've agreed with mummy what can you you know what can we get you to agree to um, you know motivating language draw them some pictures about what you're talking about um, Obviously with kids, you know, they're not the ones uh, making the foods, you know, typically when they're under 10 generally, um, and even teenagers and young adults, they may not be um, uh, making the food all the time. So you need to be able to talk to mum about hiding food food hiding good stuff so with a two or three year old present you can generally get away with that with the child being there but any older than that then it's very difficult and you have to kind of use a bit of code if the child is there and they don't have anyone to take care of them um, or they're not absorbed enough in, in the toys they're playing with or the iPad is quite useful um, but uh, you know it is it is really good to be able to plan a strategy with parents and, and not always have the child there and sometimes I quite often send them an email afterwards with lots of tips on things that they can do do you need to talk about sensitive issues and we'll talk a little bit more about this in, the mo in a moment but you know it might be things that a child might be very embarrassed about their parent talking to another adult about you know uh, it might be things to do with you know their bowel movements you know, itchy bottom you know all these kind of things that a child might not want their parents to talk about and obviously it's important information um, and obviously you know being realistic about weight as well you may not uh, want a child to hear a, a, a well, you wouldn't want a child to hear a very open and frank conversation about weight. Uh, you know, you want to be able to talk differently to the parent that you could talk to the child about. Um, and uh, what issues does the parent need to work through? That's really key as well, um, because very often it might be about the parents. And we'll talk a bit, about, a bit more about that in a moment. And uh, should the parents come uh, without the child for the follow up? That's also really key as well, because, um, you know, you might want to be able to talk openly and frankly uh, it might be they can come for 10 minutes and then not come you know it might be logistics that mum wants to come during school hours particularly if you only work during school hours do obviously practicalities most of you will know this but just to remind you think about whether your clinic or room is child friendly you know how much will your we want the parents that sit in front of you be able to concentrate if there's plugs and wires and things that can be pulled over i trend to, tend to try and fence things off if there are dangers in the clinic room that you're aware of make sure you point them out to the parent um, and you know try to make a nice space where the child could perhaps play freely whether that's a blanket on the floor cushion uh, whatever, whatever that is um, you know talk to the parent you know I always uh, get the child involved for five minutes to chat to them and then I might hand over it's up to you whether you do this but I might give them my, my phone with CBBS on you know if the parent hasn't brought something because you know is that a difficult mess I don't want the parent to think it's okay for their kid, child to watch television all the time but I really want that, that mother um, to be able to concentrate let's talk about the elephant in the room uh, and you'll see from this case study that um, this was a really difficult one for me so uh, first case study is a young girl called Hannah who's age 10 and mum was concerned about Hannah's weight and um, she called me beforehand and said look you know I'm concerned about her weight she seems to put weight on really easily uh, she has a fairly good diet um, and I just you know I've, I've struggled with my weight all my life and I want to make sure that she doesn't go through the same thing but she didn't want Hannah to be feeling uncomfortable about her weight she didn't really want me to talk to her about being overweight which is fair enough you know with a 10 year old you don't really want to be them to be thinking they're overweight but I think it's a balance between being realistic and, and supporting the child in a realistic manner but without you know develop them to develop a complex throughout their life um, so uh, she uh, brought Hannah in at the first appointment so I thought well how am I going to actually discuss this with her and what are they here for so I decided to let mum lead so question 
questions that I started with was how can I help you today um, and I was really mindful of the language that mum was using and and the word overweight was a little bit of an elephant in the room because I was trying not to use the word overweight but trying to get to the bottom of what was happening you know in my mind when a child is putting on weight and there doesn't seem to be a clear reason you're always looking for secret eating you know buying things getting things from grandparents you need to be able to question around there so I started to uh, question around healthy eating and maintaining a healthy weight and being healthy and supporting our body and, and a healthy immune balance and just using lots of general terms which seemed to suit the mum so I took her lead and, and it seemed to work with the with the daughter um, and I really educated them about sugars carbs and fats it was more of an education ses session and um, they were following a typically low fat high sugar diet mum had done various swim clubs for many years and thought that would be what would help um, and what I found as well I'm not going to go into too much of the specifics of this case but I found it really difficult to assess progress you know because you can't say have you lost any weight when the mum doesn't actually want to discuss whether her daughter was overweight so I just couldn't assess that uh, and I and I, and, I, and, I, and I really couldn't and mum didn't want to go there so uh, what I uh, did actually do was uh, we had email follow-up after that but you know at the actual consultation I couldn't discuss with the daughter you know how she had progressed because mum didn't want me to talk about you know pounds and inches and you know, I didn't think that was necessarily particularly relevant, but I did just want to monitor her progress. So what she did talk about was having more energy, feeling like her sugar cravings were out of control, feeling more full and not wanting to have foods when it wasn't a meal time. So other sensitive topics for under 10s, you know, use age appropriate children's language. There's not many children under 10 that don't like talking about poo um, and use that word. You know, if you start using stools, um, they're not going to really know what you're talking about. So let them know it's OK to talk about poo. You know, I was quite often, you know, put my pen down if it's a young child and, and get, get on their level and talk to them. You know, like what's it like when you go to the toilet? Because remember, you know, most parents, they know what their child's uh, stools are like from the age of one to three when they're in nappies but you get sort of four five six and seven and most parents aren't actually checking their child's poos anymore so they don't know a lot of the time um, you know if they've been brought in for a digestive issue it's likely that the parents might have noticed something but they may not have asked the child to look at their poos and so actually to talk to the child you know we all go to the toilet we all have a poo uh, so tell me about yours you know what's it like you know have you shown mummy lately could you show mummy could you talk her to her a little bit more you know I always encourage the parents I work with you know really talk to them about their bowel movement and and what that might say about how they're doing you know, think about ways to build rapport um, I don't know if any of you have ever done NLP training, but a really good NLP course, a simple NLP course is, is great uh, when you're a nutritional therapist. Um, I did an NLP um, and hypnotherapy professional training. And whilst I don't advertise that I do NLP and hypnotherapy with my, my families and, and people that I work with, I'm using the skills all the time in the way that I interact with my clients. Um, you know, because w biggest part of what we do is motivating. It's, you know, I can have all the nutrition knowledge in the world, but if I can't motivate these clients to make change it's kind of a little bit pointless in many ways so you know think about rapport it's about getting the mum and the child that you're working with or whoever's in the room to feel comfortable in your presence to open up you know so change your body language to match your mirror there it's like I said I'll, I'll quite often when I'm talking to kids my pen's down you know I'm talking to them straight to straight face to face uh, if they're on the floor I might sit with them on the floor you know just just I wouldn't do that for the whole appointment but I like to hear from a child um, you know uh, show them pictures of what you are describing could they just could they draw what they're describing you know maybe they could draw what their poos look like you know if they like that if they are visual you know and a lot of children are very visual that might work for them um, and tell them a little bit about the mechanics of their body that's how I try and get them engaged you know do you know why we poo do you know how long our bowels are why do you think we are sick did you know we've got trillions of bacteria in our tummies can I tell you about the army you have in your body you know just little simple things like that so that when mum's at home trying to give her her youngster more greens more carrots you know remember that immune army that Catherine was talking about all those you know little creatures in your bowels she wants you to give them some food now you know really that gives a, a way to communicate with the with a child 
these are some of the image I'm, images I might show children. But just be mindful, you know, actually my own daughter, she can't bear for some reason anything about the human body and doesn't like to look at images like this at all and it really puts her off so you know not every child is going to like gross and disgusting things as they see it you know but some like really kind of you know very graphic pictures i like the cookie monster picture as well because a lot of kids associate with this there is actually a, a cbb's cartoon that has him back on so they know who he is now uh, and you know actually I, I talk to the kids a lot about that when i'm talking about sugar you know that uncontrollable sugar eating um you know i just think the synapses in our brain in our neurotransmitters it's just so fascinating to see and uh, you know these kind of images might work with lots of different kids in the bicep there young boys typically want to be the strongest you know talking to them uh, in that way can help as well so how to gauge with uh, tween ages and teenagers, I don't know if you all heard that expression, but um, tweens is that the pre-teen age, nine till 12. Um, there's two different teenage clients really. Um, there's those that are brought along by their mum um, and they find the whole experience totally embarrassing. I don't know how many of you have worked with um, teenagers, but I have had uh, several teenage boys who kind of slouch down in their chair, arms crossed, and all I can get is a yes or no answer. And it's very difficult, even when I'm opening, opening uh, you know, using our open questions to talk to them. So you're going to be working 25% with them and, and trying to motivate them whichever way you can, but the rest is going to be with the food providers. It's those that make food. And, you know, most teenagers, their parents will be um, providing providing food now it's whether that teenager will accept that food and the changes that you're going to make which is where you've got to work with compliance with the teenager too and then you'll get very motivated teenagers and this is great and it's fun and you can really you know help them on their journey with food through life they might be slightly older they might be more fed up with feeling unwell then that invests them in the process to help them feel better you know i find typically this group you'll get teenage girls who want support with weight management uh, period irregularities uh, menstrual cycle problems and skin you know really big motivators those visual things for them or or just have, being fed up with having such heavy periods periods. So how you engage depends on their age. Some of the techniques that I use is I very much relate back to them what they're describing about their feelings. Use their words and use their language. Yeah. So if they use the word um, going to the toilet, use the word going to the toilet. If they use the word, you know, time of the month, use that expression rather than periods or menstrual cycle. You know, really it, it, it helps to create in, um, rapport and engage with them. You know, repeat back their story to them so that you show that you've understood what they're saying so you told me x y and z and so you know as a professional i'm telling you that this could be happening because of this you know actually relating their story back and trying to relate what you're saying to them specifically you know if we change a b and c in your diet it may be that you might start to feel x y and z so if they've come with uh you know a menstrual cycle problems for a teenage girl you might say well you know, if we could include, uh, you know, an extra portion of dark green leafy vegetables in your diet, um, you know, things like this, this and this, it may be that we can help support detoxification of the body and that may help to balance your hormones and that could have an impact on your periods and how heavy they are. Obviously, you're not making health claims by using, if you use the word may and could, you never say this will happen because if it doesn't happen, they're not gonna trust you. So just talk to them about some of the things that could happen that they might see. If you were to have less sugar in your diet and you only had a couple of squares of chocolate after you've had a decent meal, it may be that you might sleep better. It may be that you have more energy and you can concentrate at school. You know, really relate it back to them and their individual lives. I quite often find with the younger children um, and the tweens and even the kind of young six to eight year olds you know relate what you describe back to their heroes whether that's spider-man for a seven or eight year old or a favorite sports person or film actor or something like that you know what do you think spider-man eats for breakfast you know what do you think that um you know uh, harry potter's gonna eat when he's going out for a battle you know just simple things like that i'm sure most of you do that already obviously be careful because their favorite spider-man or something might 
might be on uh, the telly advertising Coca Pops, then it's kind of a bit difficult. Um, but you know, just just try and relate that to things that they like, um, and get very specific and tangible agreements. You know, if you um, if you have uh, you know a lot uh, of things that you're trying to work on, you have to break it down. I find with children because you know you might be working on several different uh, areas, but you know trying to get with them a specific and tangible agreement. It's almost like creating a contract and, and you can bargain on key points. You know, if they're saying, look, I'm not going to touch vegetables and that's that, you know, maybe you could be talking about, okay, well, you know, I do need, I do want to emphasize the importance of you eating some vegetables. So is there one that you pick that you could be prepared to try, um, you know, five days a week for the next week? Um, you know, if it's packed lunches and they want all the stuff that their friends have got in their packed lunches, you say, well, mommy's going to prepare your packed lunch for four days a week if you can have one day where you put whatever you want in it you know it's, it's about getting really you know concrete tangible things that they can really look at and that seems that and it empowers them you know children obviously they are cared for with, for by their parents but they need to feel empowered to make change as well and be aware of the noddies uh, for me, you know, uh, in my experience of working with children and then with adults generally, you'll get a lot of sort of, you know, nodding. Yeah, I'll do that. And, and then you, you hear from the parent next time. No, nah, he didn't do any of that. You know, it, it's it, you, you will find that will happen a lot. They kind of, you know, agree, agree. And then, it, and then it becomes difficult and they don't do it. So, you know, it's not a lot you can do about that. It's just about finding ways to motivate that child. Yeah, be mindful. I put it here when working with teenage, teenagers, but really with children of all ages. You know, what are their friends eating? You know, my kids are five and eight, and they're constantly asking me for, you know, oh, can we have? Why don't we get chocolate in our lunchbox? You know, why don't we have those, um, you know, pe pepper pig yogurts? Why can't we have, you know, those little lunch lunchables? You know, <laughs> it, it, it's a battle constantly. So what I uh, have done is, you, know, you want to do this when you're working with children is you need to go around all your local supermarkets and and find products which are child friendly that they are going to like that are acceptable to you as a nutritional therapist and when i say acceptable you know you have to remember that not everyone is going to be making coconut flour chocolate muffins you know far from it now you will get the mums that are there uh, and you'll get mums that want to go there but you'll get a lot of mums that don't ever want to go there um, so you've got to find things that you know are acceptable and healthy uh, enough and that you know you're going to get compliance with so make sure you know your local supermarkets the brands that are available and what you would be wanting them to eat um, you know make sure when you're um, in consultations ask what is available at school perhaps they could bring in the school menu um, that's really useful as well so when think about when you're working with the parents as well, you know, you need to understand basic child development so you can appreciate what a child of a certain age should be doing in terms of their development, what you can realistically achieve. And a parent might have an unrealistic expectation as well. That's important to bear in mind. You know, uh, small gradual changes very commonly work quite well with children a lot of children are not good with change some are fine but you know it's about that kind of you know everyday change so that you can get long-term success Find out about the, par the parent's relationship with food. You know, is this more about them? You know, it's really interesting because, you know, actually a lot of parents, obviously they will have got their, um, uh, their relationship with food from when they were a child and actually having a, a child brings up so many memories for them, you know. Um, I think it's really important that you talk to families that you work with about all of you making a change you know you can't expect your child the child that you're working with to be eating lots of greens and healthy stuff if, if dad's or mum is sitting there having you know uh, chips every night it's really really important and it's a really tricky one um you know in terms of what's achievable and what's doable i think you know it's about teaching children about balance i think is really key um you know i've really stressed to the parents that i work with that 
I'm not trying to get you to get your kids to have a perfect diet, you know, because that is some parents' concern. They're they're really, really concerned um, that you're going to take everything away from their child. They're not going to be allowed any treats because that's what modern day parents often look at as treats is sweets and chocolate and things like that. And it's about trying to um, manage that parent's own relationship with food. Um, so the practicalities of working with parents, so be observant of the language parents use around food. I hear a lot of parents saying, oh, those are really fattening foods, aren't they? About things like avocados and nuts and seeds, obviously, which gives a negative image to the child. So, you know, bring them up on language that they use, um, you know, try to stop them avoid you know try to stop them using the word fussy eater when they describe their child particularly in front of uh, other people or to their child you know because labels like that they get into our psyche you know if a child hears constantly she's a fussy eater she's a fussy eater i'm a fussy eater you know it's really powerful the language that we use so do do bring them up on it if you hear it can the parent cook are they prepared to prioritize food you know the kind of parents that maybe can afford to come to see you often are working parents uh, in my experience and mum is obviously juggling a lot so no judgment but you know you've got to uh, see what, what what are they prepared to change you know I hear a lot I'm really on board with this process I want to help my son but I don't have time to cook breakfast or a hot meal in the evening you know some for some parents the thought of doing a scrambled egg in the morning is just totally shocking like, are you bonkers I can't do that you know absolutely no and and it's about well you know just trying to bargain on what you think you can achieve and actually just bearing the myth that 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 isn't actually something that takes very long um you know anyone can chuck beans in the microwave and put beans on toast rather than a bowl of cereal it's just as quick but i think it's about telling people that they can do that quickly um and explain, like I said, there's no perfect diet. Um, they won't be able to do anything about the time they're not with their child. It's about working when they are with their child and educating their child on good eating habits, um, which might filter through, but a lot, of, a lot of the time they will have to just let some things go. Can you empower the child to start preparing some food on their own? You know, interesting when I get these parents are saying, I haven't got time, I can't do that. So I turn to the child, depending on their age, obviously. But if they're 10, 11, 12 plus, it's like, well, why can't you make your breakfast? Can you make your breakfast? Could you? I wouldn't necessarily say they might scramble an egg if they're 10, but I might be saying, you know, can you put some toast in and put some peanut butter on it? You know, actually, it's, you know, it's really fascinating that, you know, uh, um, we don't we, parents often are empowering their children there was um, a study that i was involved with um, was a nationwide campaign about getting kids cooking and um i think it was something like 40 percent of 16 year olds have never cooked a meal you know they're not being taught these really important skills and obviously these are the skills that they need for life and once they've left um home they're going to have to be able to take care of themselves so it's a really important consideration when you're working with a teenager and don't forget parents' guilt. You know, really interesting is that some parents might feel guilty about their child being in that way. You know, the amount of mums I hear is like, God, I had antibiotics or had something happen to me in pregnancy and I really think this is linked. You know, actually there are real emotions attached to those things. And, you know, obviously it's about not judging them. I remember um, when I was training, um, Sally Child said, uh, and I think I just had my daughter about that time, said, you know, most mothers, they have a guilt pill that's born with the, with the placenta. And it's absolutely right, particularly when uh, children are really young. But as, as they go through age, you know, parents always feel guilty for something. A lot of them do. And and that can cause some emotional issues. So what's going on at school and how much can you change? You know, I wish school meals looked like this because I have been into school meals uh, and I'm not particularly impressed, I have to say. You know, it's very difficult and schools obviously have, are under huge pressure in terms of their time. Um, and so getting change at school, uh, particularly as in the case of my children where their catering comes from outside, uh, it's very difficult to make change. Um, uh, but packed lunches aren't any better. This was in the UK in 2015. But obviously, this is where you can help. But 87% is still a sandwich. Interesting, you know, 62% is yogurt, have a yogurt in, 54% have juice in their packed lunch, crisps, still half, 40% uh, cereal bars, cheese strings, 40%. So things that are commonly thought of as healthy. You know, you are fighting a battle sometimes with changing that concept of what goes into lunch boxes. So I think it's important and useful to see this kind of information. So I would be looking at things like that. Well, what can I change for? 
a cereal bar. Okay, I'll try and get them to make a healthy flapjack if I possibly could. You know, 45% have got a bottle of water, so you could change that for the juice. Yogurt, you know, typically is going to have sugar in it difficult to find an alternative there aren't really any children's yogurts that i found that have no sugar in um you know fruit perhaps they could put in an apple a pear instead of grapes you know to, to not have such sweet fruit for example uh sandwiches switching to whole grain uh pitters wraps whole grain pasta that kind of thing so looking at key considerations for supplements, um, so make sure you draw up a list of suitable, suitable supplements, especially for those under 12, and be mindful of weight and height, not just age. You know, if you look at uh, um, children's classes, the, the, the difference in size is, is pretty impressive between the smallest and the largest. You know, children of different of the same age can be very different size. So you need to bear that in mind when you're recommending supplements and so not just going on age um, and carefully calculate the doses and, and how long they might need a higher dose. If you found a deficiency or a test shows that they need, they have a higher need for something. Obviously, you don't want you need to make it clear to the parent that they're not on that higher dose uh, long term with Without your your um, supervision, um, palatability. This is obviously so important for product for um, children. And what does that product taste like? You know, have you tried it first and foremost? And could you get a sample for the child to try? Um, you might have to accept a little bit of sweetener. Now, I'm not saying go for the you know more supermarket type brands for kids, but you know to get a child to take something quite often you do need to have some kind of sweetener in it um so powders are good to sprinkle onto smoothies put into mousse put into desserts chewables and obviously capsules that you can open if you're giving adult capsules that you can open just make sure you know what it tastes like when you open it because it, some capsules can be really strong when you open them and then looking at testing, and there are times when a blood test might be required, um, but do weigh up how useful the results will be, whether they will change your protocol, because it can be very stressful, particularly for a young child to have a blood test. So things that you can do which are less invasive, um, especially for those under 12. So hair mineral analysis is very useful, particularly if you're looking for heavy metals, um, in the case of um, children perhaps on the autism spectrum. I find they're quite nice for a good snapshot as to how progress is going. Um, obviously, comprehensive digestive stool analysis and parasitology, so key for so many children's issues, you know, support the gut as much as you possibly can. Blood spot testing, I use the Optio 3 test um, that I generally do, um, vitamin D, food intolerance. Um, you know, just check what age they are. I get a lot of mums ringing up for intolerance and allergy testing for babies. Um, but, you know, the immune system is so underdeveloped um, at that age. And usually it would be recommended that they were minimum two um, before you do any kind of intolerance and allergy testing. And you also want to be very mindful, you know, if you do a test and that shows that a child has an issue, you have to be very careful if you're taking out food groups of a child's diet, you know, that that is supervised, that that child is not going to then have nutrient deficiencies. Um, the Genova 1 test is really useful. Like I said, I have a child suspected on the autism spectrum um, recently come to see me with a 1 test. It's really, really useful. And obviously that's non-invasive. You can do urine and um, something like the nutrigenomics testing um, if you've got a swab or a finger prick or something like that um, again useful to see what that child's foundations are in terms of their um, how they process things in their body and their health so let's move on to some case studies and some specifics about um, uh, age groups and um, time is ticking on really quickly today um, so um, just think about things to think about is how was pregnancy and labor you know if this was a c-section there's some uh, a, a new study that came out a few months ago which clearly linked um, babies having c-section and a higher risk maybe sorry born by c-section and a higher risk of being overweight um, obviously as a child passes through the birth canal they are inoculated with their mum's um, beneficial bacteria so you know actually having a c-section can affect that gut microflora and there's studies that show that c-section babies have a very different gut microflora to those born vaginally so you know that's something i would really consider you know with any child that was born by c-section how is a mum coping? It's a really important one to consider because some parents take to parenting like a duck to water and some mums will tell you they're just not natural mothers, you know, so they might be muddling through and, and sometimes they might be the mums that have far too much information as well um, and know everything about everything and they've got themselves totally confused as you'll see with, as you work with uh, children of all ages and adults too, but it can be really um, interesting when, when a, you know, when first baby is born. Um, 
understanding breastfeeding you know and how to support women and, and think about the factors which may affect breast milk quality and quantity you know think about mum's diet you know common issues if a mum has a food intolerance she may um then a uh, child may have it uh you know colic reflux really common among babies and they're commonly put on things like ranitidine as we'll see in the next case, uh, case study and um, one of the things i find a lot is be mindful of a mum who's eating loads of greens thinking that she's doing really good because that really can affect the tummy of um, a breastfed baby colic commonly uh, resolves itself when you get the mum to stop eating so many greens um, although obviously greens are really good for them and it's not for every case but just just watch out they're not piling loads in um, there's a, there has been a traditionally historically quite a lack of support for mums that are breastfeeding um, and you know not every mum produces lots of milk you know I see it a lot in the women I work with um, you know so get contacts for local societies local independent midwives that that can help mums with breastfeeding there's a lot of guilt around that as well if you can't breastfeed your child um, and think about good products for breastfeeding mums so I use um, some of the uh, teas that you can get um, um, there's a breastfeeding tea um, that, that's available on the market um, and there's a, a stump baby stomach ease tea which I use quite a lot um, which can be given to mum or if baby, baby's bottle feeding a little bit to um, the baby. And another thing just to be really uh, mindful of is I have some mums that just want to book a weaning appointment. I offer a half an hour appointment just to give them a little bit of general advice on weaning, which some mums just want that reassurance. Do you understand the difference between baby led weaning or purees? It's quite well established now, baby led weaning. Um, when I first started practicing, it was quite a new thing and I, it's still something I get asked a lot. And it's interesting, you know, some mums get so dogmatic on, I am going to do baby led weaning. I'm not going to try purees. You know, this is the way. There's no alternative. This is what the book says, you know, um, and they can be really like, it's difficult to motivate them to change. But if their child has digestive issues, piling everything in possibly might not be the right thing for them. So, you know, uh, find out what the mum's approach is. And the most common art concerns I see in this age group, so like I said, weaning, constipation, colic, reflux, vomiting, you know, be surprised the amount of mums who are so frustrated that their child is only having a poo once a week and they go to the GP and they say oh, it'll sort itself out. You know, it's a worry. Um, suspected food intolerances, eczema, asthma, poor immune system, difficulty breastfeeding, concerns about baby not putting on weight, which is termed as failure to thrive. And most of the time in this age group, mums just want reassurance. They just want to know that they're doing the best they possibly can. So we look at this case study with James. He uh, first came to see me, his mum brought him when he was eight months. Um, suspected intolerance to cow's milk and soya um, and this was causing continual sickness reflux constipation dry skin on his back and wind which was keeping him awake at night and they tried a lot of uh, recommended prescribed different milks and that wouldn't do anything for him James wouldn't sit up or lie down at some points without screaming Mum was breastfeeding um, and she found that when she came off cow's milk, James improved and then she tried putting it back in her diet and there was an obvious reaction. Uh, and James was sick every time he tried soya. Um, frequent coughs and colds and infections. He was on ranitidine, which actually blocked stomach acid. So they thought it was a reflux issue. He was born vaginally, although it was a very stressful birth. And he has a family history of atopy, asthma, and hay fever. So I looked at James's existing diet. So he was eight months old. So he'd been weaned at four and a half months. Um, and they were currently cutting out all cow's milk products and soy, which was concerning the mum because she was just obviously concerned to make sure that he was having enough calcium. When I first spoke to them, I couldn't get them in to see me for a few weeks because I was away. So I talked to her about trying nanny care formula, which is the goat milk formula, which is now legislated in the EU. When I first started practicing, it wasn't. So it's very difficult to recommend. But um, as far as I'm aware, it's now um, allowed to be recommended um, for babies and for follow on milk. So uh, immediately it seemed to um, have some improvement. And the reason it tends to be better for children with digestive issues is that it's more um, similar to breast milk. Um, and the fats break down differently in the stomach in a, in a more similar way to breast milk. So he was still being sick, but only one teaspoon rather than before he was throwing the whole bottle out. And babies are sick, you know, uh, they are going to be sick. At, um, quite often a bit of milk will come up um, very often if they've just taken too much. So, um, you know, it wasn't concerning that he was just having a little bit. 
Um, and then typical day, uh, so mum was doing well with meals, but he was having quite a lot of wheat, I thought. And uh, I was wondering if this was causing him some problem as well. Um, so at his first appointment, um, obviously there's the usual practicalities of working with a baby. So she had to bring James uh, with her um, and she sat on the floor, which is quite difficult trying to talk to a client while you're writing notes, while you're writing their nights, then obviously getting them on the floor. So, you know, that is um, a common thing. And I remember this appointment really well because actually as she was on her way to go, she put him in the um, uh, in the chair, in his um, push chair uh, while she was paying and he actually fell out of his push chair which was obviously very distressing for her it was nothing that we had done at the clinic but you know it's about being mindful uh, and, and looking around and, and just trying to support um, I don't know mum was in a bit of a rush to get off to the school run so it's always being mindful of these things he was fine though, and I took him straight up to the osteopath for her um, and um, he was fine uh, we looked at moderating wheat uh, so things like wheat a bix replaced at breakfast with a mix of oats canero millet and looked at nice protein rich breakfast as well because I felt, you know, to support the lining of his gut that he might need a bit more protein. Um, she was very mindful of uh, wary of putting eggs in because dad was allergic to eggs and didn't want to try eggs uh, and I asked if she would try some him on some egg yolk which she thought she would think about um, and we looked at introducing some woolly fish and some ground seeds to help bowel movement and omega-3 lots of really practical advice was given and I put him on an infant probiotic to support beneficial bacteria levels so he'd already been doing well because he's uh, had seen an improvement when going on the nanogoat formula but one month later, massive improvement again, no reflux at all, wind transformed, a uh, little dry skin, but not much. Mum was afraid to try egg, um, but she decided to keep him wheat free because that really seemed to make a huge difference. Um, coconut milk, interestingly, seemed to make him sick, um, but she'd actually managed to get him on a little bit of goat's yogurt and sheep's cheese, and he was gaining weight really well. Um, and we really talked about uh, healthy wheat free foods. Um, I did swap his probiotic as well because she tried two different ones and one of them seemed to give him a slight rash around his face. So different products obviously children can react to and his diet was looking really good. So she came up back with him a year later and he was doing really well. Um, and I think when you've got a child on a very um, restricted, well not overly restricted, but you've made some changes and then excluding food groups, it's good to try and follow up with him if you can. He was still wheat free and off cow's milk, but he was tolerating spelt and goat dairy quite nicely, but not doing well with tomatoes. That, that seemed to upset his tummy. But mum was really inventive. So it was a great parent to work with. You know, she was using things like pureed squash to make bolognaises. Um, and occasional wheat was being given and that was giving a small rash around the tummy, but um, not, uh, uh, not such a strong reaction as before. And his skin was clear except for a slight reaction to wheat. Um, mum also realized she was better without wheat and dairy as well. So it had been a positive impact on her. Um, and I actually just spoke to her recently because he'd gone to school and mum was worried um, about him having, uh, you know, being excluded from things because he couldn't eat them. And he was also, James had developed a little bit of caution around other people offering him food you know she, mum was worried about that and she now wanted to challenge various foods um, and we kept him on a probiotic to support his microflora and bowel health and also his immune system going to school so real kind of conclusions and learning points is what mum really needed at the start was reassurance but you know the right advice it was a simple change from cows to goat's milk formula um, and I didn't make a huge change he, he didn't go gluten-free he didn't go wheat-free you know it was just about moderating and reducing for him and you know really good for him to have long-term follow-up and good to try different probiotic supplements as well so children age four to nine that's where my daughter is that's me and my daughter um they're really discovering their own identity with food now and becoming more engaged in food choices and i think this is when children can really start getting into the kitchen getting their hands on foods and um, this is when behavioral problems like the dyslexia is quite commonly diagnosed if that's if that's an issue and they may become more aware of their bodies and be able to use language that describes how they're feeling a little bit better obviously school brings new challenges and you may see any different emotions sleep, behavioural issues, anxiety and food issues uh, around that. 
So I just thought I'd just talk to you about motivation here. You know, do reward, chart, reward charts work and are they even the right thing? You know, there is a school of thought that, you know, we shouldn't be uh, encouraging children to try new foods based on, uh, you know, reward from us, whether that's any kind of behavior, whether it's positive or negative rewards, uh, and that we want them to be listening to the cues from within their body as to whether they are hungry. And that's what they should be listening to, not because they want to please mummy or get some kind of reaction out of mummy. So that should be their driver. There's a good book that you can have a look at called War and Peas, which is an emotionally aware feeding program. Um, and then she's got a good website as well. Um, it's really fascinating. Um, you want to be able to empower a child to eat. And I talk to parents a lot about resilience. You know, actually, how much is the parent giving in? Um, not on this case study, but I had a little girl that I was working with who was five. And the mum was so stressed around what appeared to be phobias of food um, I did refer her on for um, psychological support but I also wanted to talk a lot to the mum about not making any kind of issue you know this is the food we have here's a selection you know not saying it's just this meal giving and and, and not making any comment negative or positive you know actually this is what it is and making no issues around it and that did really help the mum because she was so emotionally tired oh come on just try a little bit please come on come on if you try this we'll go out we'll go and do this you know it, it's just gets so tiring you do think about uh, what parents are giving instead you know it's a very vicious cycle I have seen parents end up with very young children on awful diets because that's all they'll eat you know and and very quickly that pattern can ensue now if a child wants sweet food and they know that they if they make enough fuss over their shepherd's pie they're going to get their favorite yogurt and perhaps even a chocolate bar afterwards well what are they going to do they keep making that fuss that's reinforcing it you know but that's really hard to work with on a parent because effectively you're saying underlying it's them that's caused the issue you know obviously it's not just them but you have to be very careful with how you broach that with a parent um, you know have uh, networks around you that you can uh, refer to it's really important to have a good network if you suspect it's a real true food phobia maybe the child is choked at some point um, you know that that can obviously cause problems with food um, avoid using desserts as a reward we know generally it's not a good thing to do but a lot of parents do and I'm guilty of it you know, eat that you can have your dessert I tend to, to advise people to use the words well that's it that's fine if you don't want to eat it that's fine there's nothing else you know I'm trying in with my own children that's fine don't have to eat it don't worry but they don't get anything else okay uh, this is another good book by Sally Child as well um, with another psychologist about fussy eaters. So it's really good to have strategies because this is a, a common area. So looking at another case study, Sam. Sam presented with chronic constipation. His stools were like pellets. He often was having no bowel movements for five days. Uh, rice, white bread, pasta, common things seemed to upset him. Also bananas. Lots of time off school with chest infections. Antibiotics three times already that year. And he'd had about a month off, got better for two days, and then gone back to school and had another month off. So mum was really worried. Mum and dad were actually a client of mine already. So already engaged in this process. Um, Sam had low energy levels resilience to exercise was losing weight very quickly uh, his weight was a, is stable but he would lose weight if he was unwell um, slightly underweight at the moment um, they tried him on a wheat free dairy free diet and that didn't seem to make a difference Interestingly, I knew their fa his father because um, I went to school with him uh, and it was interesting to see the common personality traits that actually come through both genetically and developmentally. He was very similar to his father in terms of anxiety, being a real high achiever, quite stressed about that. Um, so uh, Sam had been constipated since birth. There were times when he hadn't had a bowel movement for a week and he'd been on Mobicol most days of his life. Um, he was born vaginally, but it was a very long birth. Mum breast fed for a month and because he wasn't putting on weight he was told to top up with a bottle which you will see commonly 
Uh, so, uh, other symptoms, dry, flaky skin, muscle pain, bed wetting occasionally, teeth grinder, anxious character, overly emotional, colic as a baby, pale skin, strong selling stools. Um, his current diet uh, was pretty good, but there, I just noticed that there was quite a lot of wheat going in, you know, so he was getting some good protein with breakfast, but often there'd be wheat at breakfast, often there'd be wheat at lunch, uh, and quite commonly in the afternoon and evening as well. Um, and his snacks uh, weren't particularly protein dense or varied so at the first appointment I talked to them both for the first 15 minutes he was a very uh, he concentrated well he was quite engaged in the process he knew why he was there and he wanted to listen to me but I felt at six 15 minutes was enough <clears throat> and I knew I needed to talk to mum about getting extra goodness into his diet without him necessarily knowing so she bought the iPad and that worked really well so I talked to them about reducing wheat. I said, I don't necessarily think you need to be wheat free. And that can be very difficult with a child having school meals. Um, but we talked about reducing wheat to four times per week. And I gave advice on healthy gluten free options and wheat free options. Lots of recipe ideas. I mean, that's what you need with parents is that they need to be able to make the things they're used to making, but make them in a way the child will eat, but in the way that you want them to have uh, whatever you want them to be in there. So things like buckwheat pancakes, I use the little blinnies quite a lot with kids and they seem to like them. Chocolate chai seed pudding, I often find with kids, if you blend it, they're more likely to eat it. So it's not lumpy. Um, oaty pancakes, homemade coleslaw hummus, beanie dips, just blending up some beans with maybe some silken tofu or some uh, cream cheese or coconut cream, something like that. Fish dips, again, same principle, banana bread. Um, so nut based banana breads and healthy flapjacks. And I wanted him to increase soluble fiber. So always, uh, if I can with kids and anyone with constipation, I, I use soaked flaxseed quite a lot, which you can put in yogurt or you can use the grind, ground version. Mm -hmm. Chia seed, lots of grated vegetables into sauces, bolognese, whole grains, but obviously the gluten-free ones. And I also discussed with mum about using bone broth and fermented foods, um, some, obviously some dairy and a bit of silk, um, a bit of uh, uh, soya, um, uh, Sorry, not um, not swear. My brain's gone. Uh, um, some, I actually wanted him to carry on with a little bit of yogurt. That's what I was trying to say. Fermented foods. Um, I didn't think he would eat sauerkraut, so I didn't go there. Um, so supplement wise, uh, looking for um, a broad strain probiotic. So I put him on BioCult probiotics, um, which are really nice, easy capsules to open. But I wanted him to have some extra bifidobacteria, which is the most common um, beneficial bacteria that children have under seven. Um, and then I gave him some baobab powder for extra immune support, which you could put into smoothies, uh, a nice chewable multivitamin, and then a B6 and magnesium supplement. I tend to use Relax by Nutri quite a lot with quite anxious children that struggle to sleep because it's really easy to crush. I tend to get parents to crush it down and put it between two bits of banana um, because it doesn't taste of much. So once it, it doesn't taste of anything actually once it's in a powder they don't even know it's there so follow up i saw mum at the um at her follow-up appointment and sam was doing so much better it's made such a difference the changes they were really pleased um and they felt really happy that he didn't have to go 100 percent gluten free just moderating was enough um you know important to see that link there with anxiety and constipation actually working on his stress levels even though he was six but how he processed emotions and thoughts really helped with his constipation as well and i was really intrigued by the genetic tendencies and in, in, in behavior you know I think there's something that it comes from development uh, that our personalities are quite similar, but you know, there's definitely something genetic from my experience that you see within generations. So Sophie, I'm aware of the time. Do you want me to carry on? I am more than happy for you to carry on if you are Catherine and everyone seems to be enjoying themselves and asking lots of questions. So um, yeah, I mean, fire away. <laughs> I think I've got about another 10 or 15 minutes so really happy to carry on uh, oh. if everyone would like to join me. Great. Do you want to pause for any questions now in case anyone has to go? Um, yes, we, we, okay, we've had two people very quickly pop up and say yes, please carry on, but let's cover off just a couple of questions whilst it's topical. Um, 
Firstly, we just had um, Chrissy wanted to just check when you're asking parents for photographs, is there anything specific that you want to be looking for? I mean, she obviously suggested, obviously, you want to see the face and make sure that they're not overweight. But obviously, you don't want to stress out parents or kids by saying, right, put them in this position, take a close up of their eyeballs. But is there anything in particular that you might say, what? what you need to see i'm just looking for general snapshots i just want to see and i say to parents look you know i'd like to meet the child but if that's not possible just bring me a few pictures that you've got on your phone you know or you've got some printed off i just want to see you know what their body shape is like um you know uh what their skin looks like hair that kind of thing so i don't need close-ups it's just general family everyday snapshots that's all that i need and like you said yeah i wouldn't want to stress them about it so i don't get them to take specific pictures i just say just bring a few recent pictures of them so I can just see what they look like. But I do explain why I want that as well. Sure. Um, on that note then, Caroline asked um, what your thoughts are about weighing children that specifically have weight loss or you know, weight issues. Is it something you would recommend? Is it useful with children? Or would you recommend something completely different? It's a really interesting question and I don't have a definitive answer. I don't do it. Um, and, uh, and I don't always even weigh adults that I'm working with with weight. You know, it's something I get them to do or I get them to measure. Uh, and it's something they do when they're at home. Um, my view is on it, you, know, you have to be so careful with a child that you're not you know, get, getting into their psyche, I am overweight, I am overweight. And obviously they're doing something about it, but you know, you just have to be so careful that you're not creating issues for them for the future. Now, if you had a child that was clinically obese, then uh, and and very overweight you know um i was at the norfolk obesity forum a couple of weeks ago and they were talking about a child that was that had a bmi of over 50. in that case you have to do some kind of measurement to check you're getting progress otherwise the health of that child long term is at serious risk and there has to be some kind of measurement that you're getting progress um, I have tended to see less of that kind of uh, weight of a child and they tend to be more already picked up, I would, uh, in my experience, by local authority, by health visitors, by the GP. Not always. So I tend to get more uh, children that I see where parents are concerned that their child is overweight and they clearly are. Uh, slightly you know well they are overweight but I wouldn't say that I tend to work so much with the obese and and, and that might be where uh, you would probably need to be weighing more does that I hope that answers your question I think that's quite comprehensive yes thank you um another question from Caroline which is quite topical as well um what are your thoughts on complete gluten exclusion for the first year now I recently shared a paper on my Twitter feed, I don't know if anybody saw it, about um, research that showed high wheat exposure to children in the first year can actually predispose to celiac. So I don't know whether you've had any experience of that or any thoughts on that or anything. Um, it's a very um, interesting topic. You know, if you speak to someone like Christine Bailey, who works a lot with celiac, um, a lot of the research that she uses and the way she has always worked, in my understanding, is to expose a child early. There is some research to show that early exposure is actually better and reduces the risk of developing um, uh, celiac disease. So there's research both ways. So it's very difficult. I, I think, you know, generally... Most of our children are going to be exposed to wheat and gluten in their life. So I, my view is that, and how I've worked with my own children, is that I've tried to not to be completely exclusionist where it's not necessary. Because, you know, I have a concern that in this modern day, it's very difficult to take them 100% off it, um, you know, if they're going to school and things like that. And if you don't have a diagnosis of celiac disease, now that doesn't mean that that's the right approach. Uh, but that's, it seems to be the most practical approach, in my view. Um, so that's more anecdotal, and I guess more my opinion on it. Um, I also think that parents generally wean on far too much gluten anyway. So I'm, I'm always a bit more of a balance 
like I'd never be looking at a hundred percent gluten free if I really didn't think it unless I had some real good evidence to suggest that that was the case but I'd definitely be looking at moderating and reducing dramatically and not be weaning on gluten and and and, and baby rice but be weaning, weaning more on you know the grains like millet obviously vegetables and things like that at first but when grains do come in we're looking at things like millet and quinoa and buckwheat which are far more nutrient dense anyway um, I was also reading a paper about uh, wheat and um, having spoken to my local baker as well, is that there is some concern that potentially the problem for a lot of us is with bread and wheat is not the gluten, not just the gluten, but the serious amount of pesticides in, in wheat. It's one of the most heavily sprayed uh, crops that there are. Is that what's causing our issues? Yeah, I think that's really important. And the paper that I shared was... Um suggesting that it, it was the high volumes of wheat and I certainly see in young parents who have that anxiety around oh my god my child won't eat anything they're just filling them full of pasta and bread yeah. and cake and biscuits and you just think oh my goodness this poor child and you're yeah. right I mean there's certainly been a lot in the news recently about um, wheat being sprayed with Roundup after it's been mm -hmm. harvested to preserve it yes. to dry it out yeah. which is just horrific and we're giving that yeah. to our children so yeah I think that's an important thing right there's a couple more questions but I'm going to save them to the end because I think okay. they're everything so we'll let you finish up and then if there okay. are anything that pop up we'll deal with them at the end yeah okay great so um moving on to these tweens um that's where peer pressure really begins and that's something to really bear in mind um with young you know young children is the peer pressure that they're going to be experiencing particularly at school um i had a um 10 year old that came with suspected adhd and this was a, a really common case um you know none of these cases that i'm presenting to you are necessarily you know really in depth so i find with kids actually you know it, sometimes it's really simple changes that need to happen you know it, i find it swings in roundabouts but I'm, I'm giving you just you know sometimes it's not those really in-depth cases you will get those as well but there are you know simple changes that really have a profound impact quite quickly um so harry came with mum behavior problems at school he's quite a small child very muscly you know he was like a little kind of terrier you know full of energy um, very sensitive to sugar <coughs> or reporting he doesn't concentrate he can't sit still he was distracted and distracting other children high energy all the time loved sport he was training in gymnastics three times a week and loads of other sport as well struggling to get to sleep so this kind of frenetic energy um, bowel mo movement could be irregular, tired if he doesn't get enough sleep and some anxiety going around going around the toilet mum, uh, about going to the toilet mum said, um, perhaps potentially some suspected OCD but she had told me about that on the questionnaire but I hadn't actually asked that in front of the, in the consultation because I felt that that might break rapport with Harry uh, and that might be something he might not want to discuss at the first appointment so I made that judgement whether that was right or wrong I don't know. Uh, so Harry was really keen to get support though. And for him, so I found his motivator, it was gymnastics. Yeah, so he wanted to be better, stronger, faster. So great, you know, find that hook that you, that you can work with with children. Um, his current food intake was was really good and you can see there that his meals were generally not too bad although he liked a tendency towards the fruit corn yogurts in the morning but generally having eggs most days which was good and um, typical uh, school lunches with ice cream uh, after each lunch um, home lunches were great um, uh, and evening meals were good but it was the snacks that I could see not necessarily the worst snacks but you know it's sweets orange juice pomegranate juice um, bell vita breakfast breakfast uh, biscuits fruit cake and he also had quite strong squash you know with a child and you know, put a glass of water about them and say how much squash would you have in there you know find out how much where the sugar is coming from so the plan really with him was just to re-educate him on blood sugar balance i wanted to make sure that he and mum understood um, i also suggest that mum have a meeting with school to discuss his needs and i the, it was good for mum to let the school know she was doing something about this she was worried about him getting excluded 
um, protein rich foods were discussed and we talked about which foods were likely to contain a lot of sugar and I gave Harry a bedtime routine which included yoga in the evening uh, not vigorous exercises you know I was trying to work out how late was he doing gym gymnastics and quite you know energetic sport you know which might uh, cause a cortisol release which might keep him awake at night talked about getting lights down magnesium salt baths protein rich snacks and a nice drink before bed something like a nice warm almond milk or something like that and I gave him a chewable multivitamin because I thought he was doing a lot of sport, obviously growing and, uh, you know, high need for nutrients. And I wanted him to have some more magnesium to support relaxation. Mum at the follow up was so shocked at how well he'd done. He was really embracing this new way of eating. The teachers were reporting a more balanced mood, loads of energy, though, still. But he was concentrating better. But they wouldn't support him having protein rich snacks at school because the rest of the children were only allowed fruits. But he wasn't allowed to take in protein, which was frustrating even though they could see the improvement um, he was felt feeling really good having protein before gymnastics and after I feel stronger so I'd give him a protein and carb based snack um, before and after gymnastics something like a homemade flapjack mum was really good and on board with changes um, but his sleep didn't really improve but they were working on it you know it was an ongoing thing and it's hard you know a 10 year old they've had sleep patterns for life you know it's, it takes time to to reset those uh, uh, sleeping patterns and his tummy felt better and he was realizing he was ravenous in the morning and he was getting a really good protein rich breakfast so moving on to teens and, and young adults uh, how can you connect with this group uh, so just a few tips here I tend to take a three-pronged ap approach and that would be relevant as well to the tweens group so it's about education Educating the teen, what are their motivators, as I just discussed with Harry's case, uh, hiding nutrition, so mum, dad or carer needs to hide the good stuff and making sure that most of the food at home on offer is healthy and nutritious. <clears throat> Think about with a teenager, what kind of client do you have in front of them? You know, really talk to them and don't prejudge them on what they look like. So you're going to have the motivated young teenage girl who wants to know everything. That happens, you know, in some cases. Um, I've picked this more goth girl because it reminds me really of a, a, a teenager that came with her mum and she was so dismissive as her, of her mum and they had, you know, quite a few running arguments in front of me and I could see there was so much emotion between them and mum was saying one thing and she was saying, no, I don't, I don't do that, I don't do that. And you get that a lot with teenagers, so really talk to both of them. Whether that teenager is telling you the truth, who knows, that's what mum suspected, but maybe mum wasn't empowering her to change because she was always treating her the way and expecting the same of her that she'd always expected. Expected. You know, it's really interesting our expectations. You know, you're going to get the grumpy boy that's slouching in the chair with his arms crossed and really just grunting at you. Uh, and you get the sugar addict that is just, um, there's no way I'm giving that up. That just isn't happening. There's, but there are some things that you just know that you know that they're not going to change. You know, they, they very clearly say, I am not changing that. And you can educate them on why they should, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a process. So some of the language that I might use are really thinking about the, the language that you use. You know, what do you want to get out of today? How can I help you? You know, actually, that teenager is old enough and responsible enough to, te to be te telling you what they want. They might not do, but do ask them. Don't just address the mum. Speak directly to the child. And um, mum has told me what she thinks. Now I want to hear from you. You know, make their voice count. Make them feel empowered. Now's the time for them to say exactly what they think about how mum feeds them at home, you know? Uh, can we agree on these three points? And you know, if it doesn't make any difference when you come back in three weeks, you can tell me I told you so. You know, actually empower them to say, you know, I want you to come back and tell me the truth. But let's just do this for three weeks. So this is a case I remember, it's about four or five years ago, and I remember it so well. Um, a 16 year old female student, stomach pains once a week, but they were debilitating. She was starting around the middle of her abdomen and lasting two hours, and they were making her feel faint and nauseous ongoing dizziness, low energy, especially during these episodes, um, and she had heavy periods. Low iron as well, which may have come from the heavy periods, but as you'll see in a moment, her diet may be causing issues, dry skin, various tests from GPs, celiac diabetes specialist, um, pediatric support, and she was currently on the beverine for what they had diagnosed as IBS and an iron supplement. 
So look at her diet. So breakfast, not too bad. Brown flakes and rice crispy multigrains. So no one in all that time had checked on her diet. So this is what she was eating for lunch, okay? So crisps, wine gums, Cadbury's clusters. That was lunch. That wasn't additional to lunch. That was lunch. Crisps, Kit Kat and biscuits. Uh, a home lunch was an egg mayonnaise sandwich and a chocolate bar. Um, you know, so there's our classic sugar addict. Um, but she wanted to change because she was fed up with this. And then she'd have a nice healthy tea, uh, but snacks was more of the sweet stuff, biscuits. For some reason, she just always liked snacking on spinach. I think she was trying to get her iron levels up. Um, but then there's all the other stuff that she was having as well. <clears throat> and a lot of orange juice. Okay. So just simple changes, blood sugar balancing diet, which I educated them about, you know, not just telling what to eat, really empowered them to make that change. And I talked to her about how and when to eat chocolate. You know, chocolate isn't food. I'm not saying you can never eat it, but I don't want you to eat it as a meal or when you're hungry. It should be a few squares after a meal. She was feeling so much better in four weeks. You know, all the symptoms had gone. Energy was much better. And look at her new diet. Amazing. You know, and I feel proud as a practitioner to be able to make this change. I haven't seen her since. So she's now in her early 20s. So I'm interested, you know, I'd be really interested to see how she's doing. But porridge and Lizzie's granola for breakfast, nuts on her way to school, banana and nuts at a break time, whole wheat roll or pasta, whole wheat pasta for lunch with salmon or tuna. And she'd also put some vegetables in there. Quite often she'd have carrot sticks and cream cheese. Um, her mum was making her a homemade banana loaf, I should say, sorry, not load, homemade biscuits, uh, chocolate rice cakes. Okay, they're not great, but a lot better perhaps than, um, say, some sweets and they had dark chocolate on, no white carbs at all and everything was whole grain. You know, so don't judge, don't tell the mum off, because inside of me when, you know, I hear this 16-year-old saying, you know, this is what she's eating for lunch, um, you know, I kind of want to go, what the hell are you doing, you know, as a parent myself, never judged you know, but um, such a dramatic change in a, in a short period of time. Um, so I, we're nearly finished. I just want to give you this last case because I, I want you to remember that, you know, don't, you can't be attached to outcomes and you can only do what you can do. And I, this, this case is really difficult. And I worked a lot with this family. And at the end of the day, you know, things didn't go as I would have liked. So we have Tim, who's 12, who had a skin rash whenever he goes on holiday. That's initially what they came for. Um, but very quickly, it was apparent there was a lot of uh, health issues very lethargic, mood swings, explosive stools, allergies as a baby. So, you know, I'm thinking here, gut, gut allergies. Um, and they really wanted to work on his skin, but we really discussed through, you know, what would be other things that they might want to work on. Because I could see there was so much going on for this child. <clears throat> Mum was struggling with cutting out foods because she didn't want to deprive not only him, but also his younger sibling. And, and he, made, he, he was on board, um, but I think it was all a bit kind of, yes, yes, he was a noddy. You know, I'll do it, yes, yes, yes. But very difficult for mum to get him to make change at home. But we worked on the basics of a good diet. And she, she tried her best and she did make quite a lot of changes. And I had to email her, you know, lots of very practical suggestions. We reduced wheat and gluten to three to four times a week. Um, and we discussed strategies when those sugar, he had sugar outbursts when he had low blood sugar. Uh, we put him on a chewable multi, which he wouldn't take. So I put him on an adult multi. So generally from 12, most children can go on to adult doses, some zinc to support behavior, fish oil supplement um, for supporting behavior and, and his skin as well. Um, and at his follow-up appointment, mum reported real improvements to mood. So she said, I'm not treading on eggshells all the time. You know, I quite often, when people tell me things, I write down their exact words that they quote, because it's really nice to repeat it back to them at some point. Um, less explosive stools, less smelly stools. Um, but mum wanted to know, you know, okay, so we've made this change. So is it that he actually has a reaction to wheat? She wanted it on paper that he had an issue. Um, and so we decided that there would be certain it might be a good idea to do some testing and she decided to uh, um, invest in Cyrex testing. So I don't know how many of you have used Cyrex laboratories, um, but uh, I think this was kind of her worst nightmare, what came back, to be honest. Of course, she loves her son, you know, and she... Uh, um, 
she just wanted to help him, but she was just quite shocked to see everything that was going on. So you can see that there is uh, quite a fair amount of reaction to wheat and gluten. And the one that uh, obviously really concerns me is the trans transglutaminase 2 IgG at the bottom, the 2.39, suggesting their um, you know, autoimmunity to uh, gluten in the gut. So um, yeah, he, he really needs to be on a gluten-free diet for life, but he, he wasn't really on board with that and mum was going to struggle. Um, and then I did RA4 with them as well. Um, as you can see, a clear reaction to egg, and he was losing tolerance to dairy, so whey was coming up to, as a problem, and uh, obviously the, the gluten grains were causing a problem there as well. That's interesting. One of the things you'll see on the Cyrex testing that sometimes the different particles of wheat and pro, um, gluten will come up, but when you test the whole food, it doesn't come up. Um, you know, talk to the lab about that if you're confused. But basically, when you obviously when you test the the particles, you're you're testing you know smaller uh, the, the exact thing that they're reacting to. So interesting there that he was reacting to um, equivocally to whey protein but not milk chocolate obviously there's a lot less whey protein in milk chocolate I hope that makes sense so an interesting one uh, I followed up with them um, um, but despite improvements on a better diet they were finding it difficult and Tim was making protests about his diet and mum was doing the best that she possibly could but they went back to the GP on my advice you know I said perhaps he does need further investigation and I haven't had an update since then uh, and it may be that the GP has said no he doesn't have celiac disease and we tested it and, and that's enough for them, who knows? Um, but they have tools for the future, you know, and I feel that they've given, I've given them a lot of ex information which may explain a lot of his symptoms and they may act on it when he's ready. So let's finish on a high note, one final case study. So I said I, I spent quite a lot of time working in a uh, residential unit for children with severe autism. And I wanted to talk to you about Greg, age 15. Uh, and he was in full-time residential care, severe autism and development delay. So he was non-verbal. So I couldn't talk to him about his diet. It was all through caregivers. Um, and I worked with the care workers and the catering staff so he had eaten nothing but toast, white toast and marmalade, turkey dinosaurs and potato smilers for five years. That's all he would eat. I mean, you will see that a lot with autistic children that they get very... Um, narrow in in the foods that they will accept um he had uh, fairly well good health uh, physically aside from obviously the issues that he was in the residential care for he did have some teenage acne though um so if he was given other foods he wouldn't eat them at all and he would become quite distressed if other food was put on his plate so what are we going to do about that you know when i arrived there was quite a few children in this uh, situation um that's what greg eats that's what he's always eaten there's nothing you can do about it was kind of the um, answer that was given to me. But uh, I worked with some of the care workers who were like, we have to change his diet. You know, the nurse there was very keen on him having some more food. So I got really good support from the care team and catering team. They were on board and made sure that the team around him were on board. So what we did was we began with one homemade chicken dipper made with chicken breasts, ground almonds and wholemeal breadcrumbs. The um, catering manager she was amazing and she just was so determined to help this young person. Um, so that uh, chicken dipper initially was on a plate next to his plate didn't go on his plate and he had it there for a week before he'd even acknowledge it was there you know then gradually um, the care staff would just ask him to hold it and then gradually it went onto his plate um, and and it was consistent behavior you know that, that had to happen every single day um, and then eventually he'd eat it and then we began swapping his regular turkey dinosaurs until he only had one turkey dinosaurs and lots of the homemade chicken dip and then we tried a salmon dipper and then gradually slowly he was asked to accept muffins that were made in the canteen but they had four vegetables in them you know this is the first time he'd eaten a vegetable in four or five years so the catering manager she was brilliant she'd put ground nuts and um, uh, uh, all kinds of different vegetables into her muffins we got him um, experimenting with food with raw chocolate and dipping his fingers in it you know and we hid whatever we could into his food um, and I suspect actually as he started to get more nutrients that maybe that changed his taste buds and his acceptance of different foods perhaps and over 12 months he now eats everything it's great uh, and his skin improved dramatically he grew more um, so he's gone from this very brown diet to eating uh, you know something like this you know so learning outcomes from that 
really work. You know, the, what I heard when I got there was this is what Greg eats, which is why he'd been on the same diet for five years because they were accepting that and they didn't want to distress him by trying him with other foods. It almost had disempowered him to try other foods. Um, a multidisciplinary support team were needed. So there was a lot of work also going on in the classroom, uh, techniques like now and then, you know, so if you, uh, you know, put this bit of carrot in your mouth, then you can have your favorite Disney uh, CD played, you know, very much, very simple. This happens, then that happens. Um, so never giving up ever, you know, it was so slow, the process that was made, but you know, 12 months down the line, he's eating everything. So resilience and patience. Um, and it was about more motivating the people around him and consistency. And that is one of the things you'll find both in a care setting and at home. You know, if you're trying to take a child, particularly a child with severe autism off sugar, and most of the time they get, don't get sugar, but you've got granny coming in or someone who's a caregiver coming in and giving in when that person is demanding sugar, you're putting them on a permanent sugar detox. You know, I don't know many of you that have done sugar detoxes, but that first week you feel pretty dreadful. You know, I think it's really, really horrible to do this to a child. You know, I think that's a way you can get parents to explain to other caregivers and grandparents, you know, it's like this roller coaster constantly. Um, so consistency and it worked for him because he had the same message every single day at the same time lunch and dinner so questions if anyone has any more questions I think my voice is just about to give up <laughs> yeah it's a lot of talking isn't it but um thank you so much that was really really informative and I think one thing that really resonated with me just there was the, the, the never giving up you're so right you see it so often that parents mm -hmm. are just so exhausted and so fed up with this ongoing battle that they seem to be having with their children that they just feed them what they like and they yep never exposed them and taking myself as an example I basically didn't eat anything except for jam sandwiches and chicken until I was about 16 and then it was like <laughs> on my 16th birthday my palate just woke up <laughs> and I started eating everything so it's really important that parents continue to come back again and again and again and reintroduce foods and make it normal for the foods to be there and available so um, I think that's quite quite an interesting uh, point there so we've got quite a few questions um, to cover um, firstly one from earlier Heather Lee wanted to know if you knew of any good cookbooks that parents can use with specific child friendly recipes um that's a very good question um i don't have you can write to your own catherine you should write your own I, uh, I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna work on it uh i haven't got any uh that's a very good question um why don't i have one well mainly because i tend to talk parents through it myself uh you know but if you're not so confident in the kitchen then yes looking up but they kids cookbooks you know tend to be all about baking cupcakes that is the problem yeah. um the what one of the kids the programs my kids loved actually so i so the cbb's um website is great for younger kids and there's a program called i can cook uh and there's videos uh so that's what i used to do with my kids when they were little is i'd watch a video and then we'd go and make it and generally a lot of those recipes are really healthy which is good i think there's no kind of down the middle um it's either you know like let's all get out our coconut flour and our coconut oil which is fab for a lot of parents and that's where they want to be but that there, there isn't a down i've not found a good you know down the middle with regular stuff that most people have in their cupboard if that makes sense Whoops. Yeah, so just about educating people on like swapping ingredients in normal recipes and maybe finding some healthier versions yeah. that they can then mix yeah. up and do their own thing with. Yeah, I've Great. written a little ebook which is junk food to superfood, which is on my website, which parents can download. That might be helpful. That's how I educate parents, which is, you know, how can I turn everyday stuff into super stuff? So you're very welcome to direct people there if that helps. Super, yeah, I'm sure it will. Um, question from Rosie, who just said, um, we've talked a lot about gluten and obviously not sort of fully restricting it, but are there any particular cases where that would be advised to completely get rid of gluten, obviously, if they're celiac, but any specific clinical case studies where you've thought instantly, right, gluten has to go? 
Um, I tend to kind of, I swing a lot with it. You know, I, there's a, there's a lot of cases where I would like them to be gluten free. Um, but I know that the parents are not going to go there, which is why often I'm talking to them on levels of, well, let's try them on wheat three or four times a week and see what happens. You know, I'm a big believer in taking the path of least resistance. You know, you've got to judge who is in front of you. Um, and, you know, if I set a parent a gluten-free diet and their, their child might feel a lot better, but they're so stressed because they can't achieve it and they're so worried about their child eating any gluten, is that good for their health? I mean, that's my view. Now, obviously, there may be clinical cases where a gluten-free, exclusively gluten-free diet may help, which might be the case that I told you about little Sam, who was constipated, and the parents were ready to, you know, they could have gone there, and they generally found that he was better without too much, and they mostly were gluten-free anyway. Uh, you know, psoriasis, um, eczema, there's many, many cases where gluten is a problem. But you've got to weigh up whether you think it's right for them to be 100% gluten free or whether you think they could moderate. Sure. So that's probably not quite answered your question, but I, for me and in my experience, uh, I don't think that I could answer it any differently. Yeah. It's got to be realistic and achievable, hasn't it? And I think that's important. Absolutely. Um, we have got Helga. She's asked if you treat many parasites in children and how you go about doing that. Uh, I haven't had to treat too many parasites. I've worked on a lot of gut issues. Um, obviously, you will need to be very careful with herbal protocols with children and what they can manage. So uh, I can't give you any specific advice because actually it's not something that I have uh, done an antiparasitic protocol with children, not had to do it. Uh, um, and you may have to. Obviously, stool test is really useful, but I've not had to do it. So sorry, I can't answer that. Best to go to uh, and I just thought of one more thing about the last question with the gluten. Yeah. I may um, go discuss going 100% gluten free in a child on the autistic spectrum. Yes, that's yeah. where I may be stricter. Definitely, that's probably the best idea. So then we've got a follow up to that, which is probably quite topical. Um, in children where sort of prior to the age of one, they've actually had a proper allergen diagnosed, is there any support or any way you might consider reintroducing those foods once they're a bit older and the digestive system's more developed or is that definitely a no-no thereafter? Um, generally, if children have a, a, an, a classic allergy reaction as a child, often they can be reintroduced. However, you have to assess your, um, your skills as a practitioner and how confident you feel. Because if obviously you know that you've been told that child has an allergy and you suggest they try it, uh, what if they have an anaphylactic reaction to it? You know, I think that's a really important message. Now, for me, uh, although I know a fair amount about it, I always refer back to the dietitian in those cases. Yeah, great. So we have a question from Kirsten who would like to know what should she be thinking about for a very spotty, exercise-obsessed teenage boy. He's coming in for a consultation. What would be your very first thoughts to direct her advice? Uh, zinc comes to mind with boys and teenage acne off the top of my head, uh, making sure that he's uh, uh, getting enough zinc in his diet. And I would also be thinking about his hormone balance and blood sugar balancing. Yeah, and possibly, I guess, digestive health to make sure he's actually clearing out the, the left yeah. from the yeah. back. Okay, um, we've got a, a very interesting question here about um, helping toddlers who are teething where appetite and eating very limited items is a problem how might you go about working with someone where this is the case to get wholesome good quality foods in um yeah it's an interesting question and child children will teeth so differently <clears throat> so you might find some children when they teeth they want to eat anything and everything in sight because they're just looking for some comfort 
you might find some children when they're teething they affects their bowel movement so that might be why they not, might not want to eat you know i don't know uh, how many parents there are out there the amount of times i noticed when my children were teething their stools almost became acidic and were burning their bottom you know like it it really changes the bowel i think it's due to inflammation in the body so um i think it's being mindful of all those things but it's just about getting as much nutrition as you possibly can so think about wet sloppy foods that have got good nutrition so things like I'll blend up, get them to blend up frozen fruit with some ice cream and make some homemade ice cream. You know, you might put a bit of nut butter in there for some extra protein. And, uh, you know, you could add some ground seeds and things like that. If they're, you know, it depends on the age of the child, of course, you know, uh, so different fruits can be blended up in there. Uh, you know, porridges and you can always fortify foods with coconut oil, coconut cream coconut milk um you know you can think of maybe putting a little bit of superfoods into things i use baobab powder quite a lot with children because it's a nice source of vitamin c okay great yeah so just doing what you can basically and keeping it soft yeah. and simple great yeah. um right i think we're almost there with regard to question one lady jenny did just ask um do you specifically advertise yourself for um child clients do you or and is it mainly just your website where you advertise she's interested to know how to get referrals yeah so my branding is the family nutrition expert so it's very clear from my branding that i work with children but i also when i set up six years ago didn't want to limit my market so much so that it looked like I only worked with children. You know, it's an interesting thing. You know, I love working with kids, but I find in, in my practice that when I limit myself, I don't want to get, honestly, I don't want to get bored. I like variety. You know, I like dealing with lots of different things. Um, so I am going to push my brand more towards family in my online work um, because I think that's my niche. But I, 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 I don't think it's that I don't think on my website that it makes it clear that it's just children if that makes sense yeah and I would urge everyone to have a look at Catherine's website because it's lovely and uh you can look at what she talks about and how she kind of uh markets herself and and makes people and I I agree it's kind of you said I'm the family nutritionist but you in that you're sort of saying but I can also support anyone at any point with anything which keeps yeah. your doors open which is quite nice yeah. so it's, a, it's a very yeah. clever way of being niche without being niche which is great um right I think that covers everything that everyone asked we did just have Jenny say that Nicola Grains writes good cookbooks for kids so that might be great. one for people to check out if you do specifically need a book. Um, oh, now, uh, now you've, you've made me remember Christine Bailey obviously yeah. has some fabulous children's books, her weaning and her top 100 finger foods. Sorry, I knew there was something I should know. <laughs> I, I know about the, the weaning books because that's where a lot of parents go. So I tend to recommend the Christine Bailey book, particularly the weaning purees and the um, top 100 finger foods because I know she's from principles that I really like. Um, there is another weaning book actually I can just mention, which is Suzanne Olivier, What Should I Feed My Baby? It's quite an old book and it is a little bit out there, you know, talking about making ghee and stuff like that. But I just say to parents, just ignore that bit. If you haven't got time for it, just use the, it's got really good menu plans for weaning, which I, I found useful and, and parents find useful. Great. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for all of that, Catherine. I think everybody has found today very, very helpful, very inspiring, and uh, lots of food for thought. So um, once again, thank you so much for your time. Apologies to everyone. We did, um, Kat, because Catherine was swapping between two devices, she was having sound through one, which I think meant that then the other device didn't recognize her video for a lot of you, but she did have video through most of the recording, which will be sent out to all of you um, by email. So you can watch that back and see what Catherine was up to while she was chatting away to you all. Um, any questions, queries, concerns, feel free to email education at iGenus and I can pass things on to Catherine for you and I'm sure if you were get to get in touch via her website she'd be happy to help with any quick questions that you might have so thank you so much everyone for attending thank you very much once again Catherine for your wonderful insights and uh, have a lovely day everybody thank you